So uh, we're going to get you out early. Um, you know, one of the things when you go to lectures about Crohn's and colitis right now, what do they talk about? Look on the left-hand side of the slide. They say personalized approach. Let's personalize the approach. And well, what does that mean? Well, it says um, you personalize it by how severe someone Crohn's and colitis is. Maybe their phenotype, the fistulous disease. You have small bowel disease. You have colonic disease. You can do it by the medication's adverse risk profile. I mean, a patient who had a previous history of lymphoma, what medicine are you going to give them? A person who has a sulfur allergy, whatever it may be. Um, prior medication history is important. One of the very f common things that people say to us is that what medicine should I use for this? We say, well, what did they use before, right? People who did great with a particular class of medicine, maybe just lost a sponsor, they made antibodies, you stay in class, things like that. But what this lecture is, the bottom one, is extraintestinal manifestations because most of the therapies we have are actually systemic therapies listed on the right-hand side of the slide, although the anti-integrins uh, are more selective, gut-selective, and guess what? If things go as planned, there are going to be more gut-selective therapies coming out um, within the next few years. Uh, I'm not going to read this entire slide to you. I just want to point out that there are extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. We're going to go through those on the left, and there are actually some extra intestinal complications on the right. So when do people get their extra intestinal manifestations? What this slide shows, look on the bottom, is about a quarter of them, the EIMs predate their onset of their IBD, or at least their, 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 their symptoms of IBD, and about three-quarters of them, it happens either simultaneously uh, or afterward. And um, some of the risk factors, it's more common for when people have colonic disease to have extraintestinal manifestations, perianal Crohn's disease, and in smokers. Uh, a big question that's almost always on the boards, which is always a terrible question, is about whether the extra intestinal manifestation parallels the course of IBD or if it correlates poorly with it. And we'll actually uh, go through this um, as we go through step by step. So the most common EIM that you might see are joint pains or musculoskeletal EIMs. Uh, they're about a third to perhaps even 40, it says here 46 percent, so about a third to almost nearly a half of patients might have a muscular skeletal extra intestinal manifestation. And uh, these, this next set of slides are from a rheumatology paper. So this is how rheumatologists approach IBD-associated arthropathies. I am not a rheumatologist, so um, just keep that in mind uh, with your questions. So peripheral arthritis, about a third of patients with IBD, um, large, more so than small joints, knees, more so than ankles than wrists. It's usually a non-erosive, so when they get an x-ray, there's no erosions and it usually parallels their IBD in most cases. The axial ones, which, which, which are the main, the, the spine, um, uh, up, up to, and, and the pelvis, uh, about 10% of IBD patients, the common ones mean sacroiliitis, you guys know about ankylosing spondylitis, they can be erosive, have fusion, and they're usually independent from IBD. So when I see a patient who has peripheral arthritis, and they say, oh, should I see a rheumatologist, what I say to them is, let me scope you first and see if you have active IBD. Because if you have active IBD, the rheumatologist is going to blame me. So once I get rid of their active IBD, and I've even scoped them or shown in other ways, if they still have joint pains, I say, you go running to that rheumatologist right now, and you tell them it's not my fault. Just as a general thing. That way you can kind of limit um, how you give your patients the runaround. So what do the rheumatologists do? And notice I wrote per rheumatology, because they use a lot of NSAIDs. Um, they said, first, look on the left. If the patient has IBD, treat the IBD. I mean, don't bother me, right? And then they use non-biologic. Uh, they find these following therapies are, not, are, are helpful. Um, uh, Disease-modifying drugs, which are usually methotrexate, things like that. They use NSAIDs. I put a slight line through that, or they may maybe not. Sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and they do uh, steroid injections into the joints. As far as the axial arthropathies, they usually have, they still require therapy independent of their IBD. 
Um, and it's interesting, I didn't know this, of the, the DMARDs in their rheumatology literature, they said the only ones that really help, helpful are NSAIDs. They really haven't found sulfasalazine, methotrexate, or steroid shots to be effective. And obviously, as you guys know, the, this, this is updated. Once the anti-TNFs came out, they're, they're very effective. So the old paradigm, in which we learned a lot, so you have a patient with peripheral arthritis, they called it type 1, <laughs> which is pausiarticular mostly large joints, and there are type 2 of polyarticular small joints, and um, they don't use this anymore. Don't you love that when someone, you're like memorizing the slide, I'm like, oh, they don't use this anymore? Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, just thought I'd throw that out there. So the new paradigm, according to rheumatology, is they say if they have a patient who has IBD with peripheral arthritis, first of all, they say if the, pa the patient has active IBD, optimize the therapy, and then come back and see if you still have joint problems other than the ankylosing spondylitis and things. But um, if the IBD is in remission, they, they do lead their, their paradigms with NSAIDs and a PPI, then um, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, or, or steroid shots. Um, then they may add or switch the TNF the patient's on, uh, or maybe to a second TNF. So this is just kind of their thought process going through. So as far as the axial spondyl arthropathies, which are the spine uh, and, and the sacrum, uh, the first thing that they do is, is actually physical therapy. Send a patient to physical therapy for ver, uh, various exercises to help out with that, and they do, they do a two-week trial of NSAIDs. Um, then if that's still an issue, they move on to anti-TNFs, and if that's still an issue, they switch TNFs. And then in the rheumatology world, they go, if the TNFs are failing, they go to IL-17 blockers, uh, secukinumab. As um, many of you know, I, for some paradoxical reason, these seem to exacerbate some patients' IBD, uh, and there are some patients who did not have IBD who then developed it on these um, IL-17 blockers. And the IL-17 trials in IBD, um, the patients who got the IL-17 blockers seem to do worse than the patients who got placebo. So even though when you hear all these talks about interleukin-12 and 23, and they follow the pathways, they actually work through blocking IL-17. Apparently, if you go to blocking IL-17, you can have uh, adverse outcomes in IBD. So if you see the, tele the television commercials, the direct-to-consumer ones that we love so much, when they do the IL-17 blockers, they like, don't give this to the patient who has inflammatory bowel disease. Just like that. Ah, so what about NSAIDs? So for so many years, we argued, do NSAIDs really cause IBD flares? Because the data really doesn't support that contention. Uh, and in fact, it was really funny because I remember Charlie Sninsky and John Valentine in Florida, um, the, the, we would have things, we'd say, oh, you can't give NSAIDs IBD. And they're like, we're in Florida, everyone's on NSAIDs, and we don't see any, <laughs> we don't see any association uh, with it. And they may be right, uh, maybe just case by case. Um, most of the studies were retrospective, case control. The Manitoba Registry did a large prospective study and actually found half their IBD patients used NSAIDs and they did not find an association with flares. And there's a meta-analysis shown also here, which the overall um, uh, uh, summary was that it was not associated with flares, although if you look at the, um, the chart there, you can see it certainly was leaning towards um, pot potentially be associated with flares. So those are the studies. You can memorize those. We'll test you. Uh, that'll be the post-test question. COX-2 inhibitors, you know, we were doing a COX-2 study um, in patients with, uh, with uh, ulcerative colitis who were uh, in clinical remission when the whole COX-2 thing went down um, with the cardiovascular issue, so that study was halted. Um, the idea, as you know, with COX-2 inhibitors is that they have less GI toxicity. Um, COX-1 um, is the gastrocytopractive effect, so if you give a nonspecific NSAID, you can get stomach ulcers, gastric ulcers, but in the, this is not the IBD trial, this is just a regular trial in RA patients. They showed if you use a COX-2 inhibitor, you have two-thirds less GI uh, bleeding and complications compared to ibuprofen. So that's why um, in GI world, we like COX-2s better than the non-selective ones. There have been two published randomized controlled trials of COX-2 inhibitors in IBD. Bill Sanborn and group um, looked at UC patients in remission and actually had similar relapse rates with celecoxib and placebo. And then El Miediani et al. Um, looked both in UC and Crohn's, and they actually did not find a difference um, with this um, coxib versus placebo too. 
Uh, I think um, clinically, I've had many, most of my patients who have had you know, COX-2 inhibitors have been fine. Occasionally, though, I have had some that say whenever they take it, their IBD flares. And you may find the same in your patients with NSAIDs or with COX-2 inhibitors, too. So um, in uh, patients who have active IBD that's refractory, um, that would, again, this is um, what the um, uh, kind of rheumatology or pharmacology um, look at, is they're leaning much more to um, the anti-TNF therapies. Um, there are multiple approved anti-TNF therapies, as you know, in the United States and Europe. And then typically, they, especially in the rheumatology world, they seem to like different ones than we do. Um, if you talk to a rheumatologist, um, their experience has been different than ours, so they often might switch to a different anti-TNF. So we always say if the patient is on an anti-TNF and they have good levels and no antibodies and they have active disease, you leave that family. In rheumatology, apparently they try a second anti-TNF. Um, and whenever you ask them about therapeutic dose monitoring, they say they don't use it. <laughs> Any rheumatologists in the crowd? <laughs> they, always, they always say that to us. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, the IL-17s are off the table. Steve Hanauer earlier this day, uh, this long day, I uh, mentioned the Tanercept, the, the Enbrilli Tanercept data really didn't pan out for IBD, especially endoscopically. It may be a dose issue, but um, it's probably not going to be pursued that way. Um, so what are we looking at now? Eustachinumab um, is approved for psoriatic arthritis, and they have mixed results in ankylosing spondylitis. And then tofacitinib, um, is approved for psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, and they have some phase two study that was positive in ankylosing spondylitis. So for your patients who have TNF refractory arthritis, these may be um, suitable options. What about vetalizumab? A lot of people said, oh, vetalizumab, the patients who used to have joint pains when they were doing well, they'll come back and haunt them. Well, what's the data behind it? We're all talking about how gut selective it is. Well, this is a large prospective study in France. Patients, 200, nearly 300 patients mixed with IBD. 16% um, at baseline had inflammatory arthritis. And then this, looking at this graph, so of the patients who had inflammatory arthritis who were started on vetalizumab, one-third to one-half of them had clinical remission of their inflammatory arthritis. So if patients... Unless patients have a separate rheumatologic disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, it seems that the best data so far suggests that patients who have arthritis driven by their gut may do well with vetalizumab. Dermatologic extraintestinal manifestations, erythema nodosum, you patients describe it all the time to you. You can also see this on rapid steroid taper. It almost always is easier to treat in parallels, the IBD course. Pyoderma gangrenosum can be tougher. You often have the multiple approaches, and it doesn't always parallel the course, although sometimes it does. Um, pyoderma um, precedes the IBD diagnosis in about a, about a fifth of the patients. There's the pictures there. I think we've all seen it. It usually is tender. That's one of the things. Um, it's usually purplish. It's painful. Uh, and... Um, uh, it, it, it forms ulcerations. And uh, one of the things, we have, a, we have an, a stoma clinic at the University of Chicago. We see a huge number of patients with stomas, and you can get peristomal pyodermas as well, too, which are a lot of fun to try to um, work with. You definitely need a dedicated um, stoma therapy nurse for that, advanced practice nurse. So what do we do for pyoderma? Topically, they, uh, for, they put on steroids or tacrolimus. In fact, if it's a stoma, they actually put it on the wafer and then put it on uh, the patient so it's against there. Um, we usually don't suggest interlegional injections of anything into pyoderma because we think that's part of the, the, the etiology is pathergy. Um, uh, oral steroids often work well. The problem with steroids with pyoderma is you have to taper them slowly. If you go too fast, the patients rebound. Um, we used to use cyclosporin, um, tacrolimus, but now we use, uh, for patients who the steroid course doesn't work or they have problems, we go right to infliximab or, as you can see, adalimumab. There is some data with ustekinumab, uh, thalidomide. Um, I'm sure you guys are going to use that, um, IVIG. Uh, and then you can see there's some adjunctive therapies listed there. Antibiotics, so the dermatology uses a lot of, a lot of dapsone in these patients. Um, 
azathioprine 6 MP, methotrexate, mycophenolate, we, again, in IBD, some patients seem to get a colitis from the mycophenolate. And there is data for hyperbaric oxygen, but the, the number of dives the patient have to do, patients have to do into the, the chambers is quite high. I think it's like 35 or something like that, or 22 or some football number. So uh, here's some data with infliximab. Um, randomized controlled trial, 32 patients given one dose of infliximab, and it's usually just one dose they need, or um, placebo, 46% improved on infliximab, 6% on placebo. Open label extensions, they can get their additional doses, 69% improved and 21% remission by week six. And then actually, apparently a predictor for response is the pyoderma was present for less than 12 weeks, so not a chronic pyoderma. There are case studies with adalimumab. They very well may be experienced with the other TNFs. I just don't have that data here. Um, we do use, uh, I would say orally, if you're going to use it, you would use tacrolimus rather than cyclosporine. It's so much an e such an easier drug to dose and, to, and it's less toxic. But we've had patients we've given IV cyclosporine and then put them on oral. And then um, we mentioned some of the other therapies too. Usakinumab, uh, we're getting some experience with that as well too. Um, definitely, you want um, a wound care uh, specialist. Be careful, though, about constantly re-injuring the area. So if the patient's already seen the dermatologist and they put the, and they put the special dressing on, don't rip the dressing off again. It also makes your clinic visit shorter. And then uh, the ocular extraintestinal manifestations. Uh, there, as you guys know from medical school, they, this often is all, there's always a case on the boards too. Someone comes in with red eyes and diarrhea, right? So you have scleritis and episcleritis, which typically parallels the course of IBD, although uveitis apparently doesn't. Certainly you want these patients seeing an ophthalmologist or an experienced optometrist. Um, uveitis is usually painful. You can see some of the first line therapies. Um, they give uh, steroid eye drops. Sometimes they do a uh, uh, cyclosporine eye drops, um, and uh, I, I suggest you don't try to do intraocular injections yourself unless you're, <laughs> unless you're really desperate for the business. And then um, there are anti-metabolite cytotoxic agents, azathioprine 6 MP, methotrexate, cyclosporine, and tacrolimus, and then uh, anti-TNF. Actually, adalimumab is the best studied anti-TNF for the uveitis indication, um, randomized controlled trials. In fact, it's FDA approval for adalimumab, so it might be a good one to lead with in those patients. And then uh, being gastroenterologists, we all know about primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Um, unfortunately, we were hoping that vetalizumab trials would show efficacy has not come to fruition right now. Um, and just as a reminder to you, if you have patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease who have PSC, they need annual surveillance colonoscopies. That's four quadrants every 10 centimeters, additional biopsies from any bumps or lumps, or chromoendoscopy every year. That's a, that is a board's question, and it will remain a board's question, I'm pretty sure. So in summary, we talk about personalizing approach to disease. So you should consider, you ask your patients, do you have extraintestinal manifestations? You go through that because that can also help guide your therapy. And then as we get to more of these gut selective therapies, we'll have to see if they're effective in these patients. Um, and uh, as moving forward here, um, what you do is if they parallel IBD activity, you optimize the IBD therapy, but if they don't, then you usually get systemic therapy. We usually lead with anti-TNFs for patients who have ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis, severe uveitis, because they're very effective in both areas. And then um, there's also to mention, I already mentioned those, ustekinumab, perhaps in inflammatory arthritis, certainly in psoriasis, that's a slam dunk, um, and maybe in pyoderma. Tofacitinib right now just in arthritis. And one of the nice things is we're having more and more agents coming out. We may find some benefit in those patients as well too. Thank you very much.